Sorry, there wasn't really a purpose to that, I've just, uh, always wanted to try it. Hello old sports, uh, that's a thing from the book, I'm not suddenly playing up to British stereotypes. Uh, anyway, welcome back to Lost in Adaptation, the internet review show about comparing the plot and theme accuracy of film adaptations to the books they're based on. Francis Scott Key Fitzgerald was an American writer who specialised in novels set in the Roaring Twenties, or the Jazz Age as it's sometimes called. A veteran of the First World War, he only got a chance to write a total of five books in his tragically short life as he suffered from multiple health complications and died at the young age of 44. The Great Gatsby, the third of his novels, was initially a bit of a flop, selling very poorly while Fitzgerald was alive, but gaining worldwide recognition some years later. My personal opinion on it is... it's alright. Bit wordy. Okay, fine, the book has been described by more allegory-savvy critics than I as a metaphor for the American dream, and yeah, I can kind of see that. The shamelessly decadent behaviour of the uber-rich features massively in the plot, and there's a strong warning not to put your life on hold in order to chase an idealised version of reality that would be impossible to actually achieve worked into the ending. Fitzgerald's writing kind of reminds me of George R. R. Martin, though I suppose I should probably say it's the other way around as Fitzgerald came first, but the point is, he spends a frustrating amount of time describing in detail the looks and actions of people who make no second appearance in the story. Heads up, if you're thinking about reading this book, it was written by a white dude in the 20s, so you're inevitably going to come across a few words that we have since as a society realised are kind of a shitty thing to call people, so endeavour to stop doing so. Despite what a certain demographic of arseholes would have you believe, that is the basis of political correctness. At one point, Fitzgerald wrote that Gatsby literally glowed with happiness, and that kind of bothered me because this book was written before we lost the battle to have that word retain any meaning beyond emphasis. I'm afraid that the uncultured swine in me kind of won out on this one and left me kind of bored with this book. I can see why other people found it engaging, but it just didn't resonate with me, I'm sorry. There have been quite a few notable adaptations of the G-Man over the years, even if we only count the ones that made to the big screen and ignore the made-for-TV stuff. Quite soon after the book was written, in 1926, there was a silent film directed by Herbert Brennan. Unfortunately, all copies of this film have been lost to time, leaving only its trailer to prove its existence. Elliot Nugent had another swing at it in 1949, starring Alan Ladd and Betty Field. This time with sound, but still no colour, obviously. In 1974, Jack Clayton made his own version. Interestingly, it was written by Francis Ford Coppola, who allegedly took the job as a paycheck because he wasn't sure if his other film, The Godfather, was going to make any money. And finally, so far, Baz Luhrmann, famous for such films as Moulin Rouge, took his shot in 2013, starring Leonardo DiCaprio as Gatsby, and created the film we're going to be looking at in today's episode. Fascinatingly, the reception to every single one of these films was uncannily similar. They were all praised for their book accuracy and were huge financial successes, but received very mixed reviews from critics. People who remember me gushing about how much I love Scott Pilgrim will be less surprised than others to hear that I'm actually quite quite fond of the works of Baz Luhrmann. My love for the over-the-top, energetic and surreal is strong and unapologetic, and Luhrmann seems to share in this pleasure. It's not an admiration I feel a strong urge to debate or defend though, as I recognise many legitimate problems people have with his borderline obnoxious directing style. This is also a very, very long film. I thought I noticed the inescapable signs of the climax starting, then realised there was over an hour remaining before the end. Even though I enjoyed it on first viewing, this excessive runtime Time basically stripped me of any desire to revisit it in the future. Once is enough for the 2013 The Great Gatsby. I should also mention that this film kind of rubbed me up the wrong way for entirely not its own fault reasons. The award-winning soundtrack utilised out-of-time pop songs, and that gave me serious Fifty Shades of Grey vibes that really put me on edge during what should have been some nice scenes. I have been scarred for life by doing those reviews, I swear. On a final note before we talk adaptation, has Leonardo DiCaprio ever given a bad performance? Genuine question, he's never everything I've ever seen him in. I'm actually super interested to hear what the general consensus is on this, because it does appear that both the author and the director are in the you either love them or you hate them categories, but for completely different reasons. Do let me know in the comments if you have an opinion on this adaptation. Here's mine. 
While I hate to give away the conclusion to the entire review in the first sentence, on paper at least, the 2013 adaptation of The Great Gatsby is one of the most plot-loyal adaptations I've covered on this show to date. And to recount the plot of the film is to recount the plot of the book, aside from a few minor transgressions I'll go over momentarily. In the year 1922, the story's narrator, Nick Carraway, getting a job in New York as a bond salesman and renting accommodation in the fictional town of West Egg on Long Island, in a tiny house sandwiched in between the colossal mansions of freshly made millionaires. His immediate next door neighbour, a man by the name of Jay Gatsby, constantly throwing unbelievably extravagant parties and letting anyone and everyone turn up uninvited, though Nick chooses not to avail himself of this open hospitality at first. He does, however, accept an invitation to dinner at his cousin Daisy's house across the bay in East Egg. Daisy's husband, Tom Buchanan, being an arrogant, brutish, old money millionaire who was a famous sportsman in college but now does basically bugger all except lord his wealth over people and cheat on his wife. Daisy herself being a beautiful woman with a rather sad face who seems to be outwardly very flamboyant but clearly harbouring a deep melancholy within her due to unhappiness with her place in the world. Daisy rather unsubtly attempting to set Nick up with her friend Jordan Baker, a professional golfer. Tom's mistress putting a bit of a downer on the evening by calling constantly. Tom, in blatant defiance of good manners, insisting on introducing Nick to the woman he's cheating on his cousin with, the wife of a local mechanic, and even drags him into a debaucherous party in an apartment in New York with her. Nick receiving a handwritten invitation to be a guest at Gatsby's next party, where he happens to meet Jordan Baker and an intoxicated but friendly elderly man in a super fancy library. Nick eventually makes the acquaintance of the man himself, and they actually seem to hit it off. In Gatsby taking Nick out to lunch in his custom-built yellow car, on the ride telling him his life story, in which he claims to be the prodigy of a wealthy family, educated in Oxford and decorated as a war hero. He also casually shows off his power and influence by scaring off the policeman simply by revealing his identity to him. Lunch takes place in a speakeasy owned by Gatsby's close business partner, Mr. Wolfshine, revealing that he's quite clearly into some shady undertakings. Jordan passing on a request from Gatsby that Nick invite Daisy round to his place for tea so that Gatsby could drop by and meet her, it transpiring that he and she were romantically involved five years before but had been parted by circumstance and Gatsby hopes to rekindle the acquaintance. Nick seeing just how important this is to his new friend agreeing and Gatsby going a tad overboard decorating his house with flowers in preparation. Gatsby being so nervous he almost bottles it, climbing out of the window into the rain, but returning soaked a minute later. His reunion with Daisy being initially very awkward, but after Nick gives them some time alone they quickly become re-enamoured with each other, and the three of them spend the rest of the day being shown around Gatsby's mansion. The reveal that Gatsby made up his original backstory, and the truth being that he was actually James Gats, the son of some penniless farmers. Young Gats ran away from home and ended up saving the life of a drunk millionaire, who went on to teach him how to act as if he were a posh git. After the old man died, Gats changed his name to Gats B and became a self-made millionaire through mysterious circumstances. Daisy, Tom and Nick coming to another one of Gatsby's famous parties, where Tom and Gatsby verbally measure dicks and Tom does not like the result. Daisy wanting to run away with Gatsby, but Gatsby, despite claiming to be madly in love with her, being adamant that before they can be together she has to tell Tom that she never loved him and come and live with him right there in West Egg. Gatsby firing all of his servants so he and Daisy can have an affair in secret for a while until Daisy supposedly works up the courage to say that she'll renounce Tom, but requesting that Nick and Jordan be there when it happens for some reason. The super awkward and overheated dinner that seems to finally be building up to a conclusion, but Daisy losing her nerve and blurting out an insincere suggestion that they all go into New York for the day. Deducing the purpose of the gathering from her coded words to Gatsby, Tom calling her bluff and insisting they all do drive into the city. The switching of cars as Tom tries to keep his wife away from Gatsby, but him being outmaneuvered into driving everyone except her, Tom stopping for gas and discovering that his mistress is going to be forcibly moved away from New York as her husband has figured out she's having an affair, though he's not sure with whom yet. The overdue conversation finally coming out in a suite in the Plaza Hotel, Daisy at first saying that she never loved Tom, but recounting it as a lie as she can't deny that she was happy with him for at least a while, though she still does want to leave him for Gatsby. Tom then revealing that he's had Gatsby investigated and discovered that he made his colossal fortune through naughty criminal bootlegging, something that Jay unsuccessfully tries to play off as not a big deal. Much to his disappointment, Daisy changing her mind and choosing to stay with Tom. On the way back to Long Island, Tom's mistress, running away from her violent husband, getting struck and killed with Gatsby's car, which to everyone's disgust continues on without stopping. Tom, upset about the loss of his lover and not wanting to be implicated himself, hinting to the bereaved mechanic about Gatsby. Nick, finally tired of the self-absorbed drama of the wealthy elite, rejecting 
wanting further hospitality from Tom and the company of Jordan. Nick discovering Gatsby hiding in the bushes outside of the Buchanan residence, claiming he's there to make sure that Tom attempts no violence upon Daisy, and still convinced that she's going to choose him once she's had a chance to calm down, accidentally revealing that it was she behind the wheel during the hit and run. Nick checking on them and discovering that, contrary to Gatsby's belief, it seems that Tom and Daisy are actually forming a closer bond after the events of the evening. Nick suggesting that his friend should go away for a bit until the mess blows over, but Gatsby insisting he needs to be there for when Daisy comes around. Nick staying up with him that night and getting the full story about his past, then the following morning, Gatsby deciding to use his pool for the first time that year while Nick goes to work. The vengeful widower arriving at Gatsby's to perform a murder-suicide, shooting Gatsby at the pool and then himself. To Nick's disgust, Tom and Daisy going on a long trip and all of Gatsby's friends immediately washing their hands of him, leaving him alone to arrange his funeral to the best of his abilities. The film utilised the same method as the book to make sure that you do not root for Tom even a little bit, by establishing that he is super racist early on. I think Carrie Mulligan did a really good job of capturing Daisy's earnest nature and her way of finding subtle ways of conveying her feelings when she wasn't able to speak freely. The moment she described after her daughter's birth, where she hoped aloud that she would grow up to be a fool because that was the only way she could conceivably be happy in this world, is almost as word for word accurate as it is depressing. They also recreated the bond that she had with Nick that seemed to me to almost border on the flirtatious, but I'm willing to write off as just the way that people showed affection back in the 20s. The room in which we are introduced to Daisy with its flowing curtains, which I must admit I initially assumed was a product of Lerman's artistic style, is actually described in the book pretty much as is. I was also impressed on second viewing to notice things like DiCaprio letting his posh accent slip a little when he was feeling particularly insecure about people's perceptions of him. It was a very nice touch. Nick's last words to Gatsby, that they were a rotten bunch and he was worth more than all of them together, is line for line from the book, as is what it seemed to mean to Gatsby to hear it. The film also held true to the inventive, though not often subtle, symbolism of the book, like the green light near Daisy's house that Gatsby was so enthralled with, and the old advertisement for an optician that watched everyone go about their sinful business. Nick's drunk within and without speech is book accurate, though the film takes it in a slightly more literal direction than might have been intended. Nick's admiration for Gatsby's ability to hope for his eternal optimism for the fruition of his dreams is indeed one of the core themes of the book. Personally, I think that's too generous a way of describing Gatsby's behaviour, as I think it's pretty clear in the book and the film that in their five years apart, Gatsby had created an idealised version of Daisy in his head that she could never live up to. Insisting that she not only leave Tom, but decree that she never loved him ever was his attempt to get her to conform to his mental image of her. They included the rather depressing detail that everyone, including Nick, forgot that it was Nick's 30th birthday on the day that all the shit went down. Now, in the book, this was the start of an internal crisis as Nick realised he wasn't in his 20s anymore. Ugh, big mood. But in the film, it's just there. This is possibly an example of how you maybe don't have to stick to everything from the book if you're not also able to include the point of it. I was also very impressed that the film stuck to the fact that Nick, for narrative reasons, chose to recount Gatsby's past to the audience in the middle of the story instead of near the end when he actually learnt it. So yeah, like I said, I don't often come across word for word book accuracy like this, which makes it super weird because despite all of this, the film doesn't feel like an accurate representation of the book. and. For once, I don't actually think it's got anything to do with... So, first things first, this film is narrated, and in order to work that into the film organically, Lerman added in a non-book accurate setup that Nick Carraway, overcome with depression after the events of the story, has committed himself to a sanitarium for treatment. The voiceover you hear is either him recounting the events that led him there to his doctor, or him reading aloud the memoir he was encouraged to write as a means of processing his grief. As I've touched upon in episodes past, the choice to add narration always allows for much greater book accuracy, as it returns to you the internal monologue that's so integral to a book story. Whether or not this is a cop-out adaptation-wise is definitely up for debate. I would say it depends on the story. If you can get by without it, it's great. If you can't, it's at least essential that you find a balance between consistency and overuse. Lerman, I think, managed to find that balance, so I didn't find Tobey Maguire's voiceover particularly obnoxious, especially because it more often than not directly quoted from the book, which is always nice. A small knock-on effect of this is, in the movie, they occasionally play up Nick's writer power 
past a little more than in the book to justify his doctor's suggested treatment, and his claim to only having been drunk twice in his life is now a lie because morbid alcoholism is listed on his medical chart, young Gatz's rescue of the intoxicated affluent sailor is a tad more dramatic in the film. In the book, he just rode out to him and yelled, hey, you really shouldn't park here, the tide might drift you against the rocks. They added in a surprisingly long montage of fun activities that the trio get up to after Gatsby and Daisy are reunited, which, considering they established that the rain didn't stop until around 4 o'clock, makes me wonder if rich people can afford to pay to have more hours of the day added. I think Lerman's approach to this whole adaptation is summed up nicely in the way that Gatsby introduces himself. The I'm Gatsby line was originally at a quiet table devoid of fireworks and Rhapsody in Blue, so technically it's not 100% book accurate, but gosh, Damn, that scene is awesome. Gatsby losing his mind for a second and almost decking Tom represents a significant change to the conversation in the Plaza Hotel that resulted in Daisy changing her mind about leaving her husband. Originally, there was no such display of violent temper. It was simply the reveal that he was a bootlegger that made her draw away from him, begging the question, where the heck had Daisy been assuming all his millions had come from? Or was she simply so used to splendor she hadn't thought to question his wealth at all until now? The conclusion of the movie introduces an element of optimism for both Gatsby and Nick that wasn't really present in the book. In Gatsby's case, book Nick suspected that, just before his death, the forlorn candle of hope that he held that Daisy would still choose him had finally gone out. Lerman, however, showed that the last thing that Gatsby saw was what he believed to be Daisy calling on the phone. Even though it was actually Nick checking up on him, he still at least went out thinking that she truly loved him. Film Nick's ending is improved by showing he has at least gained a sense of closure by writing down Gatsby's story in a book and some of his lust for life has since returned. Something that's not really present in the book, where Nick intentionally drives all of his former acquaintances away and moves from the East Coast because it just has too many bad memories for him. No, I've had enough. Of everyone. The film played down Nick and Jordan's relationship to the point where it's really not clear if there was anything going on between them besides a casual acquaintance. They did indeed start a courtship of sorts in the book and spent a lot of time together. Nick was half convinced that he was in love with Jordan, but after Gatsby's death he broke up with her before returning to the West Coast. There was a rather bizarre conversation about a fainting wedding crasher at Daisy and Tom's wedding that distracted from the plot for a few minutes but didn't really go anywhere. If this was metaphoric of something, I'm afraid its meaning was lost on someone as insensitive to symbolism as I. Gatsby's distraught father arrived at the end of the book to bury his son, and we learn that even though young James did run away from his parents as a lad, he reconnected with his dad afterwards and used his wealth to buy him a nice house. The drunken old man from the library made a surprise second appearance in the story, as he was the only person out of the thousands of guests who enjoyed Gatsby's hospitality who came to pay his respects at his funeral. Nick had a rather cold, unexpected meeting with Tom post Gatsby's death, where he got him to admit that he tipped off the distraught mechanic as to the owner of the car that killed his wife. Final thoughts. Because I've been doing this job for about five years now, I'm confident in saying that changes to the story during the adaptation process often occur when a confident director wants to, or can't resist, making a movie recognisably more theirs than the books. In the case of Lerman, his fingerprints take the form of the outlandish visuals and soundtrack, so in short, it does appear that Lerman could have his cake and eat it adaptation-wise. He didn't need to change the story, he just told it in his very distinctive way. This is why I said that on paper the film is super accurate, because I can't in good faith say that the directing changed the story, but it did distract from it. A fan of the book might get frustrated that the over-the-top directing, editing and scoring sometimes draws the attention away from the story, but for me personally, super subjective statement incoming, I kinda sorta thought it added some much needed life to the otherwise lacklustre story about the romantic rose of the decadently wealthy. Sorry, book fans. While I'm getting this off my chest, I also thought that DiCaprio's brand of extreme charm brought a much-needed likability to what is otherwise a rather problematic character. Despite Nick's adoration for the man, Jay Gatsby is, at the end of the day, a pathological liar and quite possibly a violent criminal trying to force the people around him to conform to his expectations of them, and without DiCaprio's smile to make you forget this, you might well end up with zero investment in his well-being. So yes, my rather confusing conclusion is this is some 
somehow a loyal adaptation and not one at the same time, and in my opinion this film is the best way to experience the story, but I'm not going to fight you if you disagree. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. If I might leave you with the usual reminder to subscribe if you enjoy the content, and that the success or failure of a YouTube channel is way more tied into the amount of likes, comments and shares a video gets than it really should in an ideal world, but that's the algorithm orientated reality we exist in right now, so if you wouldn't mind doing any or all of those things, I would consider myself in your debt. Cheers! Hello again my beautiful watchers, I just wanted to take this opportunity to give you a quick reminder that there's a wonderful website called Patreon that's been allowing online producers to actually make a living doing what they do since apparently YouTube's decided that they shouldn't anymore. Basically they offer the chance to pledge a certain amount of money per month or per video in exchange for various rewards offered by the creator. There's a variety of stuff you can earn by becoming one of my patrons including early access to all videos and taking part in that survey you see at the start of every Lost in Adaptation episode. That that's actually a very important part of the process, as I use it to gauge how much I'm going to need to explain about the book and the film before I start comparing them. If you decide to become a higher level contributor, your name will be added to the credits that you're seeing right now, and you'll be given the option to join my private chat room so you can regularly talk with me and other patrons. If you're keen enough to join the topmost tier of patronage, you'll earn the most coveted of all the rewards, the chance to pick a future adaptation to be reviewed by yours truly. However, if right now you are thinking, my goodness the dorm, I can't do that, for I have no money left after building a personal fortress to prepare for the coming zombie apocalypse. Do you have any idea how expensive a lifetime supply of food, water and ammunition is? Fear not, it would still be a huge help to me if you were to give that like button the old clickeroo, share this episode on social media with perhaps a little recommendation to your friends to check it out, and subscribe if you've not already. It really helps my channel grow and reach new beautiful watchers. I hope you have a most pleasant day, and I will see you in the next episode.